What you want more than anything is you want to meet people with different experiences. And I've always sort of found you would see things that you would not automatically have come across. Hello and welcome to the Parliamentary Review podcast, the podcast that puts leadership at centre stage. I'm Jonathan White, and in each episode I'm joined by directors, CEOs, CFOs, government ministers, chairmen, presidents, maybe one day even the president of France, as soon as those French air traffic controllers go back to work, and indeed everyone else. The aim is to discover who these people are, the people who get up each morning and make the world work. We discuss everything from which economies around the world are stagnating to which of them have the best bond rating, and of course, the innovation and success in the country that make it all worthwhile in the end. We also get their take on the current political and economic state of the country. Later on in this episode, you'll have the chance to hear our exclusive interview with Lord Pickles, former Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, Chairman of the Conservative Party, and of course the current Co-Chairman of the Parliamentary Review. But for now, we are joined by Vijay Chari, Managing Director of Charles Rippon and Turner. Founded over 60 years ago, Charles Rippon and Turner is based in Harrow-on-the-Hill, providing high-quality tax and accountancy services primarily to the healthcare sector. Vijay has looked after the tax affairs and financial details of clients in the healthcare sector for over 25 years and has been at the helm of CRT for the last decade, taking it from strength to strength. We discuss with him the business, the broader market, and what the future might hold. Uh, Vijay, welcome. Welcome, Jonathan. How are you? Very well, thank you. And thank you also for uh, coming on to speak with us uh, today. Uh, now, it's been a few months, obviously, since um, uh, Charles Rip and Turner have been uh, in the review. I think it would be a wonderful place to start, and the listeners would love to know um, uh, how business is over there at uh, CRT. Goodness me! Well, where do I start? Really, it's um, it's it's really, really taken off. Um, again, I'm in a great position at the moment where I I enjoy what I do. Um, my clients are, as you predominantly know, they're mainly involved in the medical sector, uh, which are going through huge changes at the moment. And yes. Um, yeah, my services are, are are required at the moment, particularly when there's so much uncertainty involved. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, precisely. Absolutely. Fantastic. And I know that's something, especially when it comes to uncertainty, an unavoidable subject at the moment. We'll, we'll talk about it in a bit more detail, I think, as we go on. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those that don't know, uh, of course, the firm itself uh, has its roots all the way back to just after the war, 1948. Um, so a tremendous history. But you, Avijay, uh, have been at the helm since uh, 2010, I think, if that's right. <laughs> I have, yes. I have. And what and uh, what a fantastic uh, decade you've had. And to be specific, uh, you, what reforms and redirection did you introduce to the firm uh, that has seen it go from strength to strength over the last nine years? I think it's really um, changing the mindset of of GPs in general and anyone within within the medical sector. Mm. Um, in, in in previous years, the profession was simply viewed as an add on as part of the public sector, mm. um, and over time, it's been evident the uh, changes had meant the. The um, GPs in particular need to view their their profession as a business. Um, Unfortunately, there was a lack of advice out there to instruct the various um, clientele of mine in in adopting various strategies and and appreciating what's what's actually out there. So I've been very lucky, really. I've I've come in at the right time, and um, I'm enjoying it. Now, well, that, that, that always helps, I find. Um, and as you, <laughs> you, you just pointed out there, quite rightly, Vijay, the market has changed um, so much in just the nine uh, uh, years since you've uh, uh, been uh, director there. Um, is it possible, really, to just taking that into account, as it were, to future-proof the business? Um, I have considered that. Um, I think I think in terms of future proofing the business, what you what you really need to do is very difficult to 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 patent various ideas. Mm-hmm. I think I think 
all we can do in 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 my in my in my profession, if you like, Jonathan, is just to ensure that client needs are attended to quickly. Um, if you don't, they will simply move on. As, uh, and as I've mentioned previously, the the profession has moved, the medical profession has moved from an ancillary service, if you like, mm. as part of public health, to more of a business nature, which has meant, of course, the GPs have to take responsibility, more responsibility upon themselves, mm. which therefore means they require the services of their of their advisor. Uh, so it does uh, mean my service is being used a lot more. Absolutely, and I I think uh, for perhaps people on the um, uh, outside of this world might not realise just how much more uh, responsibility GPs surgeries have been uh, given, and of course they simply, in, whether it's they have the skills or not, they simply don't have the time to uh, do the tasks that they they now have to do. I, I take my hat off to the profession, quite honestly, Jonathan. Um, it, there is so much responsibility on GPs now. Um, you start off with, um, you know, the clinical diagnosis, treating patients. GPs are more like counsellors at the end of the day. And then, of course, you've got various add-on, um, um, you know, concerns such as indemnity for professional negligence. Um, I don't know if this is an American thing which has spread over into the UK, mm. but there seems to have been an uplift in terms of negligence cases, which of course means that your GP in particular is we- very wary. I, you know, this is the, the, the from the discussions I've had, is very wary of um, providing um, specific advice without having all the facts of play. And unfortunately, when they only have a time limit um, mm. of, of 10 minutes, a guided time limit, to be frank, of 10 minutes, it's very difficult to reach um, a conclusive answer to, to, to patients' needs. Um, I'm not even going to mention pensions and tax on <laughs> pensions. I mean, that's, that's, um, you know, that's another, another bit of a concern at the moment, very topical, but when you consider all of these issues in total, it's been a very demanding yes. profession. Uh, it, and, and you're quite right. You know, I had to do have to go off uh, uh, to them, and it's um, it's very easy, I think, um, Virginia. Uh, I'll um, you can uh, crucify me later for this, but it's very easy, I think, <laughs> sometimes for accountancy firms to have a uh, uh, lazy, are uh, often lazily typecast, perhaps as being distant, rather clinical. I think it's fair to say that you all at CRT provide a much friendlier service than uh, others. And explain how important that is to have that sort of human face to, to all of the numbers. Well, uh- Hmm, precisely. I mean, in the same way that, that you need that a GP needs to build up trust from the patient, um, I, I adopt the same principle with my clientele. So, in order to build up trust between an advisor and his clientele, it's important to 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 actually understand client needs, hmm. and I make it make it a, um, a point of principle, really, to, to visit clients regularly. I visit all of my GP practices every quarter, sometimes once a month, to sit down with them, to assess the the practice, how it's run, to have a word with not only the, the partners, but the staff as well. Um, so it really is a very friendly, family orientated environment when I when I enter a, a GP practice, mm. and and it's important, Jonathan, because unless you build up the trust, um, I often find the the. The various points that should have been given by the client to you know to to their accountant is sometimes missed, mm. and in the same way that we are expected to know our clients, one way in knowing your client is to ensure that you meet them regularly, and um, yeah, it, it certainly has paid dividends. Good, and you know, some might call that um, uh, a common sense, but there seems to be a lack of that uh, um, around the place uh, these days. Now, moving back then from uh, the uh, 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 CRT itself and 
looking at the sector more broadly, uh, Vijay, where would you identify, especially in the medium, short to medium term at the moment, where would you identify the major challenges the, the sector is facing? Oh, goodness me. You, I you mean, the list that's, down, that's, <laughs> I, 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 I will do, but I, I think the greatest challenge facing primary care is, is, is well, it's, it's uncertainty. In all in all aspects of primary care now, whether it's clinical, whether it's financial, um, the problem is is that the the profession, if you like, has been used as a political football to a large degree. Yes. Um, and, and what tends to get missed all out of all of this is is it's, it's it really does have an impact upon patient care. Um, GPs are, you know, they've 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 spent years and years and years um, training to become clinicians at the end of the day, and they obviously have, you know, tremendous respect for their patients. And when they're then told the resources are scarce, and therefore their um, expertise, their advice needs to be diluted over a, a wider base, there, there is an effect, a ripple effect, which transpires all the way from your, your GP practice, if you like, all the way to, to NHS trust hospitals. Mm. Now, you know, uh, there is only so much that the profession can take. And unfortunately, if I have seen this, um, GPs, when they qualify, look at the NHS, look at the demands of the NHS, mm. and it's not surprising that they look across, you know, the pond and sort of think to themselves, goodness me, look, Canada's just over there, or you've got yes. Australia with its great weather, you've got Qatar, I think, I think I'll give that a try. And unfortunately, when I when I hear when I hear of this, it's so sad. It really, really is because I think the NHS is a wonderful asset, and all of the training, all of the expertise, you know, could possibly go to waste. Exactly uh, right, and you can mm. you can barely blame them sometimes, can you? Because you look at, I mean, we are speaking VJ in the in the midst of a. Uh, a general election, so which has sort of ruined everybody's Christmas, but still here we are. I um, I, I wouldn't have known to be honest with you. No, <laughs> anyway, go on. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head uh, when you said it earlier. Um, these uh, people that become doctors and want to work uh, in that um, vocation, that profession, do so because that's what they've they want to do with their lives. And when they see politicians as they are now politicising the health service, it must break their heart sometimes. Precisely, precisely. And and what I find disturbing, if you like, is that there's a lack of empathy for, you know, for, for GPs and consultants and anyone else within the medical profession. Um, I was hoping that some of my colleagues would, especially within, you know, accountants um, who specialize in the medical sector, mm. um, it's a it, it's it's slightly disappointing that, that not many of them have the same passion as I do. Um, I'm very political in the sense that I do fight for my clients. I do attend LMC meetings, the mm -hmm. committee meetings, Jonathan, you know, um, um, excuse me for that, but they're, they're committee meetings. And um, I'm always on hand to, 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 to sort of express... Um, the financial aspects, particularly of, of, of GPs, to, to the wider public, so that the wider public see their GP as somebody who really is on their side rather than this greedy professional yes. who's, who's taking a lot of stuff out of the NHS. Um, uh, it's a uh, it's a hard battle, I can tell you. Oh, absolutely, and very well put, in fact. And we, we've we've um, pressed it already and brought it up in the case, and it's undeniable there is so much of it uncertainty. Uh, it really is the word that uh, you can be, I suppose, in any business uh, doing anything these days in any sector, and its uncertainty is 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 everywhere. How has that affected um, the market and yourselves, VJ, in in a, in a practical sense? Well, in any other business, Jonathan, if you have uh, if you have certainty, you can plan. Mm. 
but unfortunately, within the medical sector, it's uh, planning um, just seems to be um, a term which is which is very loosely used. It's it's almost impossible to plan for anything. And a good example of this is is planning. Um, as to when a GP can take his or her pension. Now, I don't. I won't go into the specifics and the technicalities, but uh, it, uh, in terms of, if you ask your your average GP out there, do you know what your pension pot is worth? I I, I would lay my house on it that they would turn around and say, well, quite frankly, VJ, I've been in the profession for twenty odd years or more, and unfortunately, the um, the processing agents, if you like, have still not updated my records and I'm due to retire Mm -hmm. in a couple of years. Now, this isn't uncommon. And the problem with that is, is as a professional, when you're advising your GP as to when they should take their, um, their, their pension at the end of the day, it's, it's impossible to give them um, a satisfactory answer. Now, you wouldn't have this in any other profession. Unfortunately, within the medical sector, as I've explained before, mm. it, it, it was previously viewed as an add-on as part of a state service. But all of a sudden, um, for whatever reason, GPs now have been told to become businessmen or women yes. overnight, which is very difficult to fathom. Icky, well, let's say, VJ, I'll, I'll put you on the spot here. This will be unfair. Uh, let's say um, you, you, uh, right. one afternoon you had all the powers uh, of the Secretary of State at your disposal. What reform, if any, would you like to see uh, from government that would really... Well, what, to, hmm, to start off with, Jonathan, the first thing I would do is to seriously listen. Listen to what the, the, the profession is actually saying. So, in other words, I would, I mean, I know there are, um, you know, there are, uh, well, you've got the BMA, of course, you've got London Medical Committee meetings, but you really do need to listen to the grassroots. You need to listen to nurses, you need to listen to GPs, you need to listen to consultants, and above all, you need to bring in patients. Um, It's all very well for the government to turn around and say, well, we have been listening, but I'm sorry they haven't. And there seems to be pet pilot projects which have been introduced, quite honestly, on on, on the back of um, a cigarette packet, quite honestly. And um, uh, a recent one is the introduction of primary care networks, where it was blatantly obvious that the sector was was completely ill prepared for this. Um, it was introduced from the first of April, mm. um, and unfortunately, we're now in December two thousand and nineteen. Um, we've done a survey. We act for about fifteen primary care networks. We've done a survey of all the primary care networks within South West London, and I can tell you that from the results we've had, there seems to be a majority of them who, quite frankly, are screaming for more advice, yes. um, not only for or over what the role of the primary care network is supposed to be. And, and I, but I they, think, VJ, sorry, just, uh, just to emphasise yes. for people that might not be as familiar, it's, it's fair to say probably some of the most substantial changes to the GP contract in well over a decade. Precisely. Precisely. And... Um, uh, you know, we, we are regularly in contact with with various committees, um, with, with, with the BMA as well. And what seems to be the mm. common theme throughout is that there has been a lack of consultation with GPs in particular over the new contract. Uh, and I, that is echoed up and down uh, 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 the country. It'll be interesting uh, to see, uh, therefore, what the outcome of uh, uh, this particular election is. And I think perhaps we can pick that up uh, in the new year, VG. Uh, but before uh, I'm conscious of the time here, perhaps we could just uh, uh, go back, uh, return home, as it were, and, and look again at uh, see our 
you in a bit more detail. You've had an extraordinary uh, decade. Uh, what are the plans for the future, BJ? Goodness me. I, I, <laughs> that really is putting me on the spot. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, Jonathan, I have a real passion for, for what I do. I, I, I see, I see my clients as, as, as my, as my friends, effectively. Mm-hmm. And, it, just just talking to them it's 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 apparent that the profession is going through a major major change whether it's 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 becoming whether private um companies are entering into the nhs that's, that's one issue but the advent of technology is therefore meant there needs to be a realignment um, not only of training but there needs to be a realignment of how patients' needs are going to be serviced in the future. Um, we've had Babylon on the, on the scene, um, who are extraordinary in, in the use of technology. But I, I, I can actually see the, the NHS involving so quickly the, the, the role of the GP would... I, I can actually see their role changing within the next two years. The question is, the question is whether that particular GP or a collection of GPs mm. within the practice will adapt accordingly. Um, and it really is the uh, uh, question of the time, isn't it? Uh, and uh, unfortunately for us, if we had a crystal ball, it would be fascinating. Uh, we don't. Yes. Uh, for now, Vigie, uh, it's been a pleasure talking, and I hope in the new year we can discuss this a bit more because, as you said, things will be changing quite rapidly depending on the outcome of this uh, election uh, next week. But for now, Vigie, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed our chat with VJ and especially learning more about the challenges facing the sector and how the whole team at Charles Ripon and Turner are continuing to raise standards. If you haven't heard it before, coming up now is our conversation with the Parliamentary Review's co-chairman, Eric Pickles. Lord Pickles served as Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government in David Cameron's Cabinet before receiving a peerage in 2018. Lord Pickles remains active as the United Kingdom's anti-corruption champion and the country's special envoy for post-Holocaust issues, as well as being a keen vexillologist. That's flags to you and me. I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed speaking to Eric. Here it is now. Eric, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, Now, I'm sure you won't uh, mind me reminding the listeners that uh, you've been involved in politics, both local and national, for quite a number of decades. Um... Indeed, before we, the days we were in the common market. Um, you know, given your experience over those years, um, what thoughts have you had over the last few weeks and months about the current political uh, situation the country finds itself in? The situation is quite dire because we have um, a parliament that um, is by and large useless. It's like a bored teenager on a long drive. And um, it wants, it knows what it doesn't want, and it's so bored with Brexit, but it can't agree. So no matter what you put up, it's against it. Are you in favour of a referendum? No, I don't want that. Are you in favour of uh, remaining within the single man? No, I don't want that. Are you in favour of, because no, I don't want to do that, no, no. And are you in favour of leaving without a deal? No, we don't want to do that. So it's against everything. But it, there isn't enough votes to be in favour of something. And it could be by the time this, this podcast goes out that, that uh, Boris has uh, started on the process of the bill because we'll be voting on that today. Uh, but even then, it, what people don't seem to understand, this is not the end of Brexit. Right. This is barely opening the door of Brexit. We've got years of negotiations about fight, about trade agreements, relationships with uh, with Europe, putting uh, putting down pieces of legislation. We get our agriculture, our fisheries, our financial service into place. Brexit is going to go on and on and, and sure on and on. I'm sure we are. Um, now uh, the question is: I should actually remind listeners that we are talking on the day that the second reading of the uh, uh, Withdrawal Act will. Uh, take place. So, as we speak, we don't quite know. As well, perhaps like the government front bench, don't know what's going to happen. Um, 
you compare Connor to a petulant teenager, what would you do to a petulant teenager to sort it out? Um, is there a chance that it will see sense and push this through this bill without breaking amendments? Is there a chance it will vote for its own uh, for a general election? What do you th- how do you see this playing out at the moment? The sensible thing will be to put this deal through because I've always been of the view a deal is better than no deal because this is just the beginning. In order to start the process of Brexit, start the process of uh, the United Kingdom taking over powers that it's uh, it's not really exercised for 40 odd years, the smart thing is to get this thing through now. But in a way, it's not about Brexit itself. If there was a free vote, this deal would have gone through. Mrs May's deal would have gone through. But it's about politics. It's about a Labour Party that thinks it has a chance uh, trying to make the Prime Minister, whether it was Theresa May or Boris Johnson, uh, look as though that they are uh, in office but not in power, of um, delaying as long as possible. There's a lot of talk about... um, an election uh, in the autumn, maybe back end of November, beginning of uh, of December, uh, something for us to look forward to before Christmas, is beginning to look less likely. It's beginning to look as though they might want to drag it into spring to get as far away as possible um, from the rather decisive moment that uh, Boris came back with a deal. We have to remind ourselves that nobody thought he could deliver um, a deal and it does quite shock them and if you remember all this process went through in order to ensure that we are left without a deal when we have a deal suddenly oh no it's not that kind of deal we don't want that kind of deal we want something different I think the vast majority of people in this country whether they remain or leave uh, now would be very satisfied for this to come to a um, able conclusion and as correctly just said, uh, because when it does come to those in the opposition who claim to want this to make, and then to, uh, uh, introduce wrecking amendments, they introduce uh, new objections to it, the general public are getting quite frustrated. But you've got to understand that quite a lot of people don't get beyond a small area within Westminster, sometimes cliche referred to as a Westminster bubble and go back to their own patch. Now, by and large, everybody hates their MP, except when they're at home, doing the fairs, doing, you know, uh, wandering around, uh, helping people. So they, in a way, they're cosseted to that great, which I feel is coming as a tsunami of change. I you were, of course, MP for Brentwood for... Uh, 25 years. Absolutely. Um, what would you, I mean, of course, you... Resident there as well, despite being a proud option, obviously representing a good Essex seat. What would you say to your, your old constituents right now? You hang in there; it'll be all right. Well, um, uh, you're, uh, it's different when you're a member of Parliament because you know you've got to kind of toe the government line a little bit. So, one thing I've found now is I've got my weekend back, and I say what I want. And uh, I think I always say to. Um, our constituents is that it is pretty hopeless down there. Thanks, Mark. On that, uh, I think, uh, honest assessment, it, it's something I think the Parliamentary Review has always done quite well, talking frankly about problems, issues, and also not just good practice, but leadership. Well, I was used to, I mean, I was used to read it when I was a, a, a member of Parliament, um, mm. because, I mean, what you want more than anything is you want to meet people with different experiences. Mm. And I've always sort of found... Uh, it quite a, um, uh, a kind of a chatty magazine, but also you would see things that you would not automatically have come across. I certainly have attended um, the receptions over the year, and it's amazing the things you kind of pick up. Uh, and I think it's important to stress it's not because uh, uh, politicians are, are, are uninterested, because honestly, as you will know, more than anyone, it's an issue of time. And to be able to have a channel uh, and a platform where you can keep communication lines between businesses, schools and policy makers is so exceptionally important.
No, I think so. You know, yeah. and it's important that it's beholding to nobody. People, um, uh, you know, pay for to be part of the publication, pay for to be uh, um, uh, members, and it's a way of not being holding to government, not beholding to anything. Uh, now, uh, you're echoing the words, of course, your fellow uh, chairman, uh, Lord Blunkett, has said. That some, what some might not know uh, is that you started your political journey, perhaps even further left than David Blunkett. Oh, absolutely, I was a communist. Now, uh, what, what, uh, what was it? At the age what? of 14, I got. Uh, I was bought um, the um, <clears throat> Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, and I read it from cover to cover. I tried to read it a few years back and I just couldn't follow anything. Oh, so I was going to say perhaps you might know the minds of the uh, show front bench better than, better than they do themselves. From my position when I first joined, I would regard them as recalcitrant uh, <laughs> ruling dogs of the capitalist system. Now, what was it that, that uh, moved you from radical Marxists to running uh, the only uh, inner city council controlled by the Conservatives in the 80s? Well, I was very young, and um, I was fascinated by what was happening in um, uh, in what was then Czechoslovakia and uh, Dubček, and the the revolution that was taking place there inside communism, and the way in which uh, he was uh, repressed by uh, by uh, by Mr. Brezhnev, yeah, and the tanks and taking over. I was so angry. And I'm 16, remember. Mm. I'm really angry. I thought, what's the most outrageous thing I can do? Um, I will join the um, I'll join the Conservative Party as a protest. And I kind of sticked around. And my family thought it was the funniest thing that ever happened uh, to us. I was Eric the Tory. And um, well, I think you announced this quite grandly uh, as, a, as, a, as a grand protest. I did indeed. But um, do you know, I kept going down and. Um, it was a it was an exciting time. Um, people were developing the ideas of what the Conservative Party should be. Selsdon man, mm. even Heath looked radical. We had different ideas, and just it eventually clicked. And at some point, I became a Conservative, and that was fifty one years ago. I think I'm definitely one hundred percent a Tory now, through and through. Through and through. Although I do know the story. Uh, most most uh, people might guess that a, 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 cons- a dialogue conservative like yourself would have perhaps a portrait of um, Mr. Thatcher or Mr. Churchill in their office. But uh, who is it that you have? Uh, at um, at Che Guevara. Uh, which always, I always had them over my uh, left shoulder for visitors, and they always used to kind of, you see their eyes going up and thinking, who, yeah, I can't possibly be it. Someone asked me if it was Desi Arnaz, I thought it was um, <laughs> Paris Lucille Ball. But no, the reason I, I did that was to remind me and to remind my uh, officials that without constant vigilance, the cigar chomping commies would take over. <laughs> I, I'm sure David Bunk was in the room to reply to that, actually. Um, but um, in, in, in that long journey, you eventually ended up, of course, in 2010, doing something most Conservatives would never thought they would have to do, but in a coalition government with the, the old people, the Liberal Democrats. That's right. Now, um, for something I think perhaps today more than ever, uh, people and our politics seems to be almost wholly determined um, on how we voted in a referendum three years ago. Yeah, I mean, the most normal thing would happen after something like that mm. would be the would be the country would come together, and if anything, we're 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 more divided. I mean, I thought working in the coalition. I'm proud to have been part mm-hmm. of that coalition. Um, I'm proud to have worked alongside the Liberal Democrats, who I think realise that, like all minority partners in a in a coalition, they would suffer at the polls. Do you think we've lost the ability uh, recently as a, as, a, as a people to work with those that we might disagree with on? Issues more than we used to. I'm not sure that's right. Um, I mean, you can see various members of the Conservative Party working closely with Liberal Democrats and Labour to defeat their own government, but it's not a thing I think I would want to encourage. Quite. Um, and I, I should remind this as we are recording this in Victoria, um, just over the road, uh, Cardinal Place, uh, a fantastic you know, development site which wouldn't have been there without some of. Uh, your uh, 
uh, legislation. What was the proudest? I, I personally approved it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What was the proudest moment you think in uh, serving Secretary State for five years? It's um, my actual proudest moment. We did a thing called uh, Triple Families, which was the first centre right uh, attempt to deal with poverty and to deal with mm. um, difficult families that were causing a disproportionately large amount of um, of, of call upon the um, uh, upon the state. And it was on the basis of tough love. It's on the basis of getting people into jobs. It's about dealing with. Uh, uh, the kind of the whole, the family as a whole, not just one or two individuals that, had a, that were having a problem. And I'm pleased that it's continued. Um, and since, I should very much stress, that since of course you're uh, stepped down being an MP, you do have your weekends back, but that's not to say you haven't remained very active and very um, uh, busy. Of course, can you use the government's anti corruption uh, champion, Sean, the harsh light of day over malpractice in the local government, um, indeed, the Queen's speech. We've just had include some of uh, your recommendations from uh, 2016. Um, I think a couple of things on that. First of all, are you surprised? Um, I may imagine you may not be at some of the backlash towards in this country introducing uh, voter ID for voting. It is absurd, and it's particularly absurd coming from the Labour Party, because it was largely Labour's vulnerability uh, that got my interest in trying to do something about it. And um, it's a bit like saying, you know, you're requiring people to show some ID, uh, that this is suppressing voting. It's a bit like saying the post office is suppressing parcels because they demand to see uh, uh, some ID. I think um, they've got um, uh, a bee into their bonnet that this is something like they've got in the state to repress it's not mm. it's about giving confidence to the system now the electoral commission and foreign observers have warned us for such a long time that our electoral system is vulnerable and it's, it's to misquote um, uh, John Major we are really sort of old males cycling to even song oh, and, and war bears <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's such a basic thing it's an important thing. And it was kind of interesting uh, in some of the trials. Um, they did um, a focus group with a bunch of uh, young uh, Asian girls. And they said they thought the process of a photo ID would actually give them a greater confidence in the fairness of the system. I meant to make all kinds of uh, recommendations to stop uh, postal vote harvesting. Uh, to, for, to to stop various fraud taking place, to stop um, intimidation at counts, to stop intimidation outside polling stations. And I, I think you referenced it earlier, the, the Westminster bubble, a lot of the, the places where this occurs and the places where this does go on are places where perhaps uh, many members, many people in the press don't usually go to. No, they, no, I don't. Uh, we saw uh, a YouGov poll that said the overwhelming majority, well in the 60%, thought these, this idea was sensible. Yeah, and I, 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 um, I, I imagine you're quite proud that that recommendation is uh, in the speech. Yes, I mean, I'm a bit frustrated they didn't do it sooner, but it's, nevertheless, I'm very happy that it, they, they are doing it. It's as if the government's time has been taken up by something else and we're not focused on anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but with a man, though, with his roots in... Uh, local government. Uh, do you think, and, and how much you've worked with this, with that report, especially looking at them carefully, how would you rate our current state of local municipal politics? Well, it was very good. Mm. I mean, local government, don't get me wrong, it's, uh, it's by and large corruption free and it, do, it does a remarkably good job. And it was, in truth, my worries about local government and that these measures were brought in. I don't believe the fraud is big enough to be able to take a parliamentary seat, but it is big enough to take a council. Mm -hmm. And if you are negligent, uncaring about the probity of the poll, you're likely to be equally negligent about the awarding of contracts uh, 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 to your friends. Uh, so it's, it's all passed up. But look, government is, is, is a very enduring part of our constitution. I mean, I've got a bit stick because we had to take some money from them. But by and large, they survive very well. Excellent. Now, uh, beyond um, obviously, uh, that work, you also supported the uh, British envoy for 
Uh, Post Holocaust is huge. Yeah, sure. I think very dear to your heart. Um, I know you've done some fantastic uh, work recently, including with um, the former Shadow Chancellor from the Review uh, in Balls. Um, would you mind, uh, if you could just let the listeners know what projects you are working on with that and, and really the importance that has to so many communities around the country? Well, I used to be very unpleasant about Ed Ball and he used to be very unpleasant about me, but I found working with him. Uh, remarkably easy and we've not had a, a single row in two years and by now we're beginning to be able to, re- to finish each other's sentences. We're building a, a memorial to the Holocaust so next to Parliament uh, with a learning centre below it and the reason why the Prime Minister chose that site is that um, it was David Cameron and he wanted to ensure that when people left the memorial they would look and see Parliament and recognise that it was the last bastion against tyranny. But more important, to remind people who work in Parliament that that the legislature has a choice. It can either protect its citizens or it can oppress its citizens. And we do know that, um, uh, that it was a compliant legislature that brought in the Nuremberg uh, laws. And at a time when there are parts of Europe that are seeking to rewrite their history and seeking to see themselves as only the victims of the Nazis, I'm determined that we should tell the truth in an unblinking uh, way. Um, We are, I suppose, at a critical crossroads when the last survivor is likely Mm -hmm. to not be no longer with us within the next decade and a half. And at that point, we do know that um, uh, history starts to be reassessed. I think it was Simon Sharma that, that talked about this. And he was referring to the French Revolution. And of course, most of the books written in the 1850s are the ones that have uh, shaped um, our view of the French Revolution. But the difference is this that uh, slightly over 100 years ago, my grandfather, Edgar, Mm. uh, grabbed hold of his Lee Enfield and walked out of a trench in the Somme and walked towards um, the Germans. And within a few minutes, uh, most of the people who'd been been brought up with, most of his friends were dead. Nobody doubts that he did that. But there's a whole industry out there that doubts that the Holocaust took place. So that's why it's important that we help frame that narrative. And any uh, reference as well, it's, it's, it's so important, especially at this, this time, this time of history, so many years afterwards, that uh, people, young people in schools get the correct education about it. How do we compare as a country in doing that compared to some of our European friends? We're, we, um, I think, compare remarkably well. Uh, uh, particularly because we've got a mixture of things. Uh, we, ins- we ensure through the lessons of Auschwitz that two pupils from every secondary school go to Auschwitz each year, uh, that they have a preliminary meeting, uh, a visit and a, a wrap-up. We ensure that um, Holocaust Day um, uh, is remembered in January, and I can remember starting that. Uh, or I'm not starting it, but being part uh, of a foot soldier of people that put it together. And you know, it's like one man and a dog, but now it's quite a, a massive, it's, it's a massive um, event. So I think we are quite good at remembering that. I think where we perhaps do need to have a wider understanding is beyond the death counts. And we need to kind of understand uh, the Anstatt group, which was the roving murder squads. Um, how um, important they were. You were more likely to have been shot in a ditch than to end up in a, in a death camp. Um, and uh, they, the interland of that is Lithuania, where I was uh, last week uh, talking to colleagues and through, through Belarus and the Ukraine. And it's really important that we ensure that we, we register where those death sites are. And I think... Uh, Certainly, uh, and I'm going to sit down next to speak, which really won't be too um, long away. It's and I think we'd be very happy to, to keep updates on how that how that project is going because it's so important. And people do need to be aware of it. Um, looking to the future, though, um, I imagine it could actually 
very uh, content and happy. Former Prime Minister, friend and colleague David Cameron just released his book, and you came you look quite unscathed from it. I came out, it was very nice about yes. it. Um, I even bought the audio version. Because he was reading it, and he obviously, you know, but there was a fair bit of affection, and and, yeah. and I'm rather glad they left out one or two of the other embarrassing things. <laughs> Maybe another time. Yeah. Yes. Um, but um, it's um, important, I think, uh, and I'm conscious of the time. So, but I'm, I think it's important that today people have become so perhaps um, caught up in what's happening in this country regarding Brexit. Um, looking to the future, how would you, and what would you say that it's a positive thing that, that this country has to look forward to? Well, we're a large trade. We're a large trading nation. We're a large uh, economy. We're a liberal uh, uh, democracy, and it would be good to get through uh, Brexit over the coming years, and it would be good to start to look at some of the social issues uh, that we need to tackle, those have been left behind uh, by our economic uh, uh, progress and it will be good to see some solid investment in this country, both in terms of its infrastructure but also in, in terms of the way it operates as a democracy. And I know there's going to be a huge focus of the next review, uh, and because you very much for joining us. Thank you. As always, it's been a pleasure interviewing and learning from our guests. I hope you all enjoyed listening. Until next time, I'm off to the Sherlock Holmes to raise a glass to raising standards. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. You can find every episode on iTunes, YouTube and Spotify. The views expressed by each guest in the podcast are their own. They do not represent the opinions of the Parliamentary Review, Westminster Publications, Lord Pickles, Lord Blunkett, David Curry, or any other guest on the podcast. If you'd like to know more about the Parliamentary Review, please visit www.theparliamentaryreview.co.uk.